Welcome back to the OPEX podcast where fitness is explained. On today's episode, I am joined by Greg Everett from Catalyst Athletics. On this episode, Greg and I discussed many topics, including coaching burnout, technical models for the Olympic lifts, corrective strategies for technical flaws with the Olympic lifts, programming, and rehabilitation. Guys, this was a great conversation with Greg, and I hope you really, really enjoy it. Okay, Greg Everett, thank you so much for making time to come speak to me today, particularly with a seminar on this weekend. So today's Friday, just for the listeners, and, and Greg has a two-day seminar and a certification, I believe, coming up uh, tomorrow and on Sunday. So I really do appreciate you making the time. How have you been since we last spoke? Well, it's been a while, so I'd say on average, I've been very good. (laughs) Great. It's funny, too, because I was saying to you, uh, I was listening to your very last episode in your own podcast with Ursula, and uh, since we last spoke, that was 2014, you had your own injury in between that, I think it was 2015? Was that when you had your shoulder injury? Uh, Yeah, it's August of 2015. Wow. And I definitely want to talk about that, because we are going to talk about, as I said to you before we got on, like, return to return to performance i like to say people say return to play or return to i like return to performance because it's one thing to get back training or competing it's one thing to get back to your previous best or even in better so i'd like right. to talk about some return to performance uh protocols that you would commonly see or have used whether with yourself with your athletes in terms of olympic lifting and coming back as i said from maybe a shoulder issue or back or knee or whatever it would be um but well, as i said to you offline sort of the topics i want to go into today are around your technical models because I find the way you teach the Olympics very good. I'm not just saying that because you're on the other line. Um, <laughs> well, you kind of have to say it, don't you? Your way, your way. Well, teaching- I agree with you. I think they're all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your way of teaching is bullshit now. Just yeah. so yeah, I want to get into the technical models with you, um, and even even the technical model for squatting too, because I know there's one or two things there in terms of just distribution throughout the feet, the way you should drive out the hole, even just little things like that. Um, so technical models, programming, which I, I love talking about. And I remember the last time we spoke, we actually had a really good conversation about how you'd set up your program in terms of, you know, going from your accumulation intensification into your peak and blocks, which is really good. And we discussed how you do that for beginners, intermediate, advanced. Uh, we'll get into, I'm going to ask you about common myths and mistakes, and then we'll get into that rehab. So that's kind of the outline. Um, but before we do that, just for anyone who may not be familiar with who you are, and if there is, I would imagine it's very, it's going to be very limited to very few people who've never heard of who you are, because like you're just an absolute monster with regards to the amount of material you pump out. Just give us a brief background and give us an update on what you've been doing since we last spoke four years ago. Well, uh, I run a company called Catalyst Athletics, um, and company is kind of a loose term. I mean, technically, it's a corporation, but really, it's it's kind of just me. Uh, my wife, Amy, of course, does the books and uh, a couple administrative things like that, which is very helpful because if it was my responsibility, we'd probably be homeless by now. <laughs> um, but so we do, we, we basically publish educational content. That's kind of the primary purpose of Catalyst Athletics. So books, uh, video content, online content, like articles, we have an entire uh, weightlifting exercise library, um, you know, with video and, and explanations of execution and programming. Um, and so essentially what I, what I tried to do years ago when I started it, I think 2006, um, was be kind of the central resource for people, uh, both athletes and coaches, uh, who were needing to learn more about the Olympic lifts. And especially at that point, when I started it, there was really nothing uh, out there, uh, like it. And I think that's really why I was a, as successful as I have been is because I kind of, it, it was basically right place, right time. Um, and I, I just hit that window perfectly. So, uh, been around for a long time doing that. Uh, I was a competitive weightlifter at the national level, uh, until a couple years ago when I unintentionally retired myself with a shoulder injury. Uh, but of course we'll talk about that more later, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now, uh, my wife and I relocated to Oregon two years ago. And so we, we closed down the the big commercial gym we had been running for eight or nine years um, in California, moved up here. We've got a gigantic garage that's uh, fully outfitted as a weightlifting gym. So uh, we have a couple local athletes, but primarily uh, she and I both coach our remote competitive weightlifters. She also coaches some competitive CrossFitters uh, like Cody Anderson who came in 10th place at this last CrossFit games. Um, And we're actually, we swore we would never do it again, but 
as of last week, we opened another gym uh, about 20 minutes away from where we live. So I'll, I'll be really hands off on that. Basically, my only responsibility was getting it built out, you know, doing the flooring and installing rigs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and Amy and Cody will really take care of the day to day along with some other coaches. So um, that was the the only way I agreed to it is if I didn't have to be there every day. So that's pretty much what's going on now. So basically your Bergner style, your garage is your gym. Yeah. And that was, that was a big part of what we wanted to do is, you know, I had, I owned co-owned the the fourth CrossFit affiliate in the world with Rob Wolf uh, and his wife, Nikki uh, did that for a few years, moved down and trained with uh, Mike Bergner for a few years. Um, and then once Amy and I, my wife and I moved back up uh, to the San Francisco Bay area and opened that gym, you know, I had accumulated 12, 13 years of running gyms and I was over it. And it's just mm -hmm. for anyone, I'm sure there are plenty of people listening who own gyms and uh, you know, there are so many great things about it. There's so many things to love about it, but it is extremely stressful. It's a lot of pressure. It's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's the worst thing you can possibly do to yourself as an athlete. <laughs> Even though that, that seems to not, you know, it seems counterintuitive. It's, oh, you open a gym. Oh, it must be so good to be an athlete. You get to train all day. Like, well, yeah, you can technically train, but you're just beat to hell all the time and exhausted and uh, that kind of thing. So uh, we, we moved up, up here and wanted to go back to kind of the, the classic, you know, American weightlifting style garage gym and not have that pressure of running a gym business and be able to just focus on what we liked doing, which was coaching and creating content. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of, you know, trying to come up with sneaky ways to get clients and things like that. I, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's actually a discussion that I've been having an awful lot lately with a lot of peers and guests and just other individuals within the profession, you know, um, basically it's just coaching burnout. It, 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 that's kind of yep. around the topic we've been talking about, whether it be from owning a business or whether it be actually just being in the coaching profession itself. Like the common one I've been kind of talking about is I have a lot of friends in professional sport mm -hmm. and, you know, they get a job at a high level and like, you know, you know, for the first year or two, they're like, oh, this is great salaries, great jobs, great. I love it. I can feel like make a difference. And then, you know, they're two, three, four, maybe five years into this, you know, role with a very high, high uh, profile organization. And like, they get this voice in their head going like, I kind of don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. And then they see they have this psychological battle in their head where like one voice is like, you're so ungrateful. How could you? You, this, you said this is all you ever wanted. And if you got this, this is all you ever want in life. And now you're telling me you're not, you're not fulfilled for it. And then like, they have this just like, this like demon in their mind where they're like oh my god i'm so ungrateful because i'm telling myself this isn't fulfilling me anymore and like it's to be able to give people permission to say listen your priorities and core values in life are dynamic and will always change and what fulfills right. you in one given moment in life might necessarily and for, for for more than likely would not fulfill you for your whole entire life like what gives you fulfillment in your life is going to change because you are a dynamic organism so you, yeah. you know you're again goals priorities for f things that fulfill you are going to change throughout your life and it's okay to move on when somebody doesn't fulfill you anymore because otherwise you're, you're doing yourself in a service because you're unhappy and then you're actually doing everyone around you in the environment of the service because you're not a nice person to be around and you see that then like coaches or business owners they just end up being assholes right. and like it's so sad because like you know like they're they actually are a really good human it's just a they're just carrying this burden around so much that it's making them come across as if an asshole. They're just being the worst versions of themselves because they're, they're just like, they feel like they're in, in a prison. Like they can't escape this. Cause again, that voice and you're so ungrateful. You have to stay here. Now this is, <laughs> you said this was like your ambition and now you're telling me you don't want it anymore. Whereas again, if you told them or liberate them with the, with the information that listen, fulfillment is a dynamic process. Life is dynamic. Again, what fulfills you one moment, is going to change moment to moment. So it's, it's well, like, uh, in, in addition to that, I think, I think what a lot of people don't realize until they are a few years down the road uh, is that coaching just by its very nature is extremely emotionally draining and mm -hmm. emotionally demanding. And so if you don't have, um, if you don't have a way to cope with that healthily and, and a way to kind of balance everything in your life, you do burn out mm -hmm. and you get in that position where you, you kind of feel resentful about your athletes and you feel like you're being taken advantage of and all these things. 
when really it's, 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 you know, maybe you have change and that's not really what you love doing anymore. But I think so much of the time you do love doing it, but you just get so beaten down yeah. that you start resenting it. You, you, you're unable to enjoy it. You're unable to commit fully to it. And I've, I've definitely been through spells of that mm. throughout the years. And I think most coaches have, um, and it can be really difficult because you realize like, Hey, I've got a responsibility to these athletes. They're trusting me to get them where they need to go. Um, which requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of commitment. You can't be one foot out the door the whole time. Or like you said, you're doing them a disservice and you're doing yourself a disservice. So it, it really comes down to recognizing when you're kind of uh, on the edge there about to kind of tip and being able to take a step back and say, okay, what do I need to do to kind of get things rebalanced um, and be able to have that kind of natural motivation to continue doing what these athletes need me to do? And, and, because if you can't do that, um, you really have to be able to say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. You need to find someone else to work with you because it's not fair. You know, yeah. you got athletes who have, you know, huge uh, aspirations and ambitions um, and they're, again, they're trusting you to do what it, it takes to help them get to where they're going. And if you string them along for three years, knowing that you're not at max capacity, that's really unfair to them. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you just said there. And I think too, and another point too on this is that this carries over to every aspect of your life too, because this goes into relationships too, like a relationship that fulfilled you at one stage for either party again, can, can not fulfill either, either person anymore. And if they stay in that relationship, it's unfair to both people in it. Or if it's, if it's just one individual in it, again, because it's dynamic. Like for, fulfillment, like life, is dynamic. And, and just to be able to know in your mind that it is okay to move on and to seek fulfillment in something else and, and, to know then, and to know as well that like there is no like destination. Like life's just a continuous journey. And like when one chapter ends, you're going to start another chapter. And it's just, it's just to know that, it's, listen, it's okay to finish that chapter and move on. Right. Um, listen, that's great. What a great way to open up the podcast because uh, I think that's a very timely topic because it's kind of been top of mind awareness on not only the OPEX podcast here, but on my own and just on my own, in my own personal conversations with people. Because um, I think another part of that too, sorry, just wrapping up and it just came to my mind and you can expand on this too, is I think another reason why people stay in an unfulfilled position whether it be in a job or a specific area of their life is that we've a lot when i say we i mean like the vast majority of people probably listen to this we kind of have this like subconscious belief that we need to like be tough and man up you know or you need to you need to grind it out like because that's the other thing i see with the coaches in those top organizations is that like i i said like anyone that's heard me talk about this are gonna laugh now because this is what i always say and you can probably um resonate with this it becomes a game of one-upsmanship greg you know like right. i i was here at 4 a.m and I yep. didn't leave till 8 p.m. And what? And you were here at what time? Oh, you came at 6 a.m. And you left when? Oh, it's 6 p.m. Oh, so I'm four hours up on you. I And like they're not saying this out loud, but in their head, they're like, I'm winning. I'm better than you. I was here four hours more. And then like, right. then like the kind of third person who actually kind of gets it, like this person walks in, gets it. This is the person that they all hate because he comes in at nine and leaves at four. And, he, <laughs> and yeah, he's like super productive and everyone loves him and he's happy because he's got balance in his life because he's got a great relationship at home with his kids. And like he looks after himself and trains and eats well and just everything's in balance. And they're right. like, how does he get so much done? And he's only here like, you know, half time we are. But he walks in and he's just like, yeah. And, uh, and like the guys that are like saying, oh, I was here at four. And then, you know, under, I slept in the office. That guy who, like, who was balanced, like walks in and goes, yeah. And uh, you're getting divorced and so are you. And when's the, right. last time you saw, when's the last time you saw your kids? And it's just like, oh yeah, that's right. You were, you were divorced how many years ago? You know, it's just like, it just, it just becomes, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy too. That they play that victim role, you know, like, you know, again, right. the game of one-smanship. Oh, I'm suffering more. Therefore, I'm more worthy of my place in the world kind of type thing. And it's just, it's just shit where people need to like get over themselves. Cause I, I've, I've actually been offered some paid internship positions with, with teams in top organizations. And they're like, they're like, oh, now they're long days, 12 hours, 14 hours. And like, I remember when I heard that my first thing was what the fuck is taking you 14 hours a day to get done? Like how, I, unpro how, honestly. Un how unproductive must you be? Like, why are you there 14 yeah. hours? I, so I don't know if you have anything to expand to that, but it's just, again, this kind of relates to our topic. Well, yeah, I think, I think there, there's definitely that sense of one upmanship, um, where you, 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 you have this compulsion to kind of prove yourself and prove your value and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And the simplest way to do that is with, you know, very obvious metrics. Like I was here 16 hours today. 
which is more than you. Um, I have six more ulcers than you do, you know, the, the <laughs> real simple things. Um, and, and so versus looking at the outcome is like you said, how productive are you? What are you actually producing at the end of the day? What have you actually accomplished that we can check off the list? Um, and you, you know, you look at a lot of these tech companies and I hate to use this as an example, but, uh, a lot of them kind of experiment with these weird office hours where that you're not in there nine to five. It's not a set, uh, office time. It's you have tasks a through C and if you can get them done, I don't care where you do them, you know, when you do them, you know, prior to the deadline, whatever, just get the work done. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's that outcome based perspective where if you can get it done, uh, you know, you have the freedom to choose how you're doing it. And I think so many, uh, of these things, people lose sight of that. And it's, it's again, that grind is like, Oh, you know, it's so great. I haven't slept more than four hours in, in three months, but I don't care because I have to keep grinding. It's like, well, you should care. And I, those, those motivational videos that talk about, uh, you know, you can sleep when you're dead and, and all that bullshit. They drive me up the wall because it's, it's, it should be such an obvious thing that if you are not sleeping enough, if you're not eating well, you know, these basic things that allow you to function at, at maximal capacity, you're not producing maximally. You're just torturing yourself for no good reason. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be periods of time in your life where you have to do that for, for one reason or another, but that shouldn't be the norm. And it can't be the norm for long. I mean, you literally will die if you try to do that for long enough. And so I think, you know, changing that perspective and, and having those outcomes in mind, like what are, you know, what are my goals? What am I trying to actually achieve? And how can I do that in a way uh, where, like you said, you have balance with the other things in your life, whether it be friends or family or, you know, your physical activities and, and those kinds of things where you, you are, rested enough, you are sane enough that you actually can produce more in less time. Uh, and I, I think, you know, you, you talk about these strength and conditioning jobs where they're there 12, 14 hours a day. That's just poor planning. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and probably on the, on the part of the organization more than the individual, but um, that, that paradigm definitely is not doing anyone any favors. There was a documentary with Bruce Arias, the former um, Arizona Cardinals uh, mm -hmm. head coach. And out of, and I've I, just lately just, it's kind of, you know, you go through, through these little phases in your life where like, oh, that was my American football phase. I'm in that right now where I'm watching tons of these doc, <laughs> these doc, I'm watching all those like America's game and, you know, football life. I'm football watching, life, I love yeah, that show. Yeah. I'm watching tons of those. And out of all the episodes I've watched so far, he is the only coach who said that uh, if coaches were in the facility longer than they should have been, he'd fired them. Because he, he was the only yeah. one that said he wanted balance. Everyone else. Right. And in that documentary, they're all like, yeah, like he'd be out fishing. He'd be out fishing, like, you know, during the right. season. And Bruce Harris like, yeah. He's like, if you're there all the time, you lose the hunger, you, you'll get resentful, all this. Like, and I was like, thank God fucking one coach out of all of them said it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely. Well, look, I mean, that, that was the classic story about Vince Lombardi is that he, I mean, it was nothing but coaching football in his life. And it, he had killed terrible him. relationships in his family, died, you know, at a ridiculously young age. And he, he sounded fucking miserable for most yeah. of his life. Yeah, they said that. And I literally just watched that, uh, the 67 team. And they were, all the players were like, yeah, he was just, he aged wickedly that year. He just seemed yeah. depressed because he knew he was, he was burnt out and he was finished. And yeah. he died three years later. He got cancer and passed away. So he's still a legend. But like, again, the one thing I'll say about that, one thing, one caveat in this, and James Cyril taught me this, he was like, if the individuals that we are discussing here are, this is the key. This is the key point. Are aware of the trade-off that they're making, mm -hmm. and they fully accept it and embrace it. He's like, then there's no judgment. But he's like, most of them don't. They're, they're unconsciously aware and they play the whole right. system role and all that. But yeah, if an individual is aware of the trade-offs, be it their health or relationships, and they're like, yep, yeah, I, I, that's the trade-off I'm making because I, I want to do this. Well, then that's fair enough. Because sometimes it's like when you ask like elite athletes, would you would you take this gold medal if I told you it's going to take ten years off the end of your life? And they go, absolutely. I'm like, okay, let's get to it. Then. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I probably would. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, getting into the training talk and um, technical models. So take us through your technical models for the clean and the jerk and the snatch, and you can go as long on this as you want or as detailed or short to yourself. 
Oh boy. Talk about an open-ended question. Um, <laughs> And, we'll and, how- and Greg, you can tackle this from any way you want. Like, so if you're like, well, this is this this is like what's commonly out there. This is where maybe I'm slightly different. Anyway, listen, you. Yeah, ask- no, I get you. Yeah. I I think the way I initially kind of distinguished my teaching methods was that they were definitely more in depth. They were more um, detail oriented than what was commonly used, and it it was always it struck me as so funny every time I would see a quote unquote progression for the snatch that would, I mean, I'm not making this up. It would be like, you know, overhead squat, uh, snatch from the hip, snatch from the knee, snatch from the floor. So that's how you learn the snatch. Okay. Well, where's the part where you learn how to do the snatch? That's just snatching from three different positions, right? Where are you teaching me how to do the motion of a snatch? And so it all—it it was always just this dome scratcher to me. It's like, I, it, it's just this thing. I, I think a lot of it came from the fact that weightlifting in particular in this country um, was very small and only people who were successful were naturally talented athletes who could kind of pick up that motion just through uh, imitation. And so they didn't really need to be instructed clearly. Like my wife, that's how she learned is, hey, you see what those guys are doing? I want you to do that. That's how she learned how to snatch. And for her, that worked because she's a phenomenally, naturally talented athlete. Uh, That's just kind of how her mind works, is she can look at something and then replicate it fairly well. Um, Of course, the issue was years later, it turned out there were some chinks in her armor because she hadn't learned certain fundamental things. And so that that teaching method kind of leaves a lot to be desired in, in a case like that. And, you know, as weightlifting was growing in this country in large part due to CrossFit's influence, uh, you know, more and more people who did not have athletic backgrounds, who were not 18, 20 years old and and these spry, mobile, uh, you know, bloodthirsty young men and women uh, wanted to learn these lifts. And so you, you can't just say, okay, snatch from hip, snatch from knee, snatch from floor you got to teach them how to do the snatch. And so uh, my coach, Mike Bergner, had what someone else told him to call the Bergner warm-up, which was basically a progression that he used with PVC pipe. Um, and he has a stepwise fashion to teach components or elements of each lift. And so I kind of adapted that um, in, in a way that I thought better suited, you know, the people that I was encountering and it kind of made more sense to me. Uh, and so I broke the snatch down into, I think, six different motions. Um, it, the clean is five or six. The jerk is five or six. And it was all the same logical pattern for each one. And each element, that it was uh, you know, a segment of the total motion, but it was also uh, a piece that would allow you to focus on very specific principles of the lift. And so, you know, for example, when I give a seminar, we run through this progression and at each step, I'm using that as a jumping off point to teach certain principles. So it's not like, okay, here's how you do a tall muscle snatch. It's more, here's how you do a tall muscle snatch and this is why we're doing it. These are the, the things that you need to be paying attention to. This is why we turn the elbows out to the side. This is why we pull the elbows up and out to the side before turning over. This is why we punch the bar straight up overhead when we finish that turnover. And so it was, it was, um, it, it was really from the start, it was a way um, to, to teach the information that in a way that was digestible and, and accessible to anybody, regardless of their athletic background, regardless of their goals, regardless of their, you know, their current level of mobility or speed or whatever. Um, and, and so I think that was what was so appealing to a broader audience and kind of got that momentum going for me is like, Oh, okay. Wow. Anybody can learn how to do this stuff. And the great thing about it too, is that it is really just a template or a framework that you can make as simple or as complex as you want or need. And so if you're teaching a a beginner with no athletic background, you run them through these movements, you drill them, you know, the body kind of learns the pattern, you put it together, you've got to snatch a clean or a jerk. For someone who's a little more advanced, uh, you know, you can, you can focus more on 
the, the information uh, aspect, the, uh, you know, the more complex principles and things like that. Um, and then for remediation, you can use all these things. You have someone who's already known how to snatch and clean and jerk for a while. While you go back, you know, here is, is the, the point in the lift where things are falling apart. Um, so let's focus on this one or two segments. These are the principles that we teach with these segments that need to be reinforced or retaught, uh, you know, whatever the case is. And it's, it's a simple way to do it, but it's, it's been very effective for me and a lot of other people. And so I think that's really, you know, kind of the, the basis of, of that technical model, as you called it, is, is that it has to be a, a framework that provides a huge amount of flexibility and accessibility so that you can, uh, you can be successful with the broadest range of, of athletes or clients possible. So could you talk us through your technical model or way of teaching the snatch and the clean and jerk? The uh, yeah, I, I probably could. Uh, so we, I start in, in all three lifts, I start with the receiving position, right? The position in which you're going to receive that bar, or catch the bar, or some people. Pull can, it. I, I know this is going to sound like a stupid question, but can you, can you just give the reason to why? And the reason why I said it is because I teach the receiving position first and listen i know there's no like fully right or wrong way but it just never made sense to me to start the other way around of course not it doesn't make sense to start the other way around because and, and the analogy i always use and i'm uh, sorry and, and i I'm, I'm very sorry i apologize for cutting in but and i'll let you speak fully now and i'll shut up is uh and you you've heard this analogy too like if we're getting in a car and we don't know where we're going what the fuck are you doing like you need right. to know your, you need to know your destination like Absolutely. And, that, and that's, that's all it comes down to is it's totally illogical to learn how to pull a snatch if you don't know where it's going and how to, to put it there and how yeah. to hold it. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very simple, logical thing. Uh, we need to know where we're going to go, what position we're going to be and how we're going to hold that bar before we learn how to put the bar there. Mm -hmm. uh, so with the snatch, uh, I teach that overhead position first, just straight up overhead position, standing up, uh, you know, we, we press the bar from behind the neck. So we know how to set the shoulder blades, how the bar is positioned relative to the trunk and the head, uh, you know, how the elbows are oriented, how the hands and wrists are positioned, all that stuff dialed in first. Then we go to an overhead squat, all right? So how to maintain that good position in the, 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 the bottom of a squat. Um, and we've already, before we get to that, we've already taught how to squat, mm -hmm. right? I teach the squat totally in isolation. Um, uh, and, and people get really confused on this. They have, you know, different squat techniques and stance for back squat, front squat, overhead squat, uh, at least in the context of weightlifting, front squat, back squat, overhead squat should be essentially identical. Um, you're going to have very slight differences in the angle of the trunk, but we're talking about a handful of degrees. It's not a completely different lift. Um, so we get that overhead squat. That's our, that's our basic receiving position. They know where they need to be and how to hold the bar, how to position their bodies, how to be tight in all the right places. Um, then we move into a series of snatch balance exercises. So pressing snatch balance, uh, a, a drop snatch, a heaving snatch balance, and a snatch balance. And what that does is that basically progressively introduces um, speed and precision uh, and, and footwork into that receiving position. Right. So we're, we're, we're finalizing that snatch receiving position by, uh, you know, moving the feet, sitting into the bottom of squat and punching straight up on the bar in that perfect overhead position. Mm. Um, so once we've established that, then we learn how to actually pull and turn the bar over. So I teach, unless I have really good reason to do it differently, I teach the snatch and the clean from mid thigh. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people will teach from the knee. Uh, my coach Bergner taught from the power position, uh, which he and I define as a, you know, vertical trunk and bend in the knees. Uh, but I teach from mid thigh because I want it to be right at the border, um, of that second pole where that, you know, that the initiation of that final explosive upward extension. Um, and that's the point at which we want to, uh, really begin opening the hips. So up until that point, we want the shoulders at least slightly in front of the bar, mm -hmm. And so if we initiate from mid thigh, that's when the knees are going to move forward to allow that vertical proportion with uh, propulsion with the legs and the, the final hip extension. So from there, we'll do a snatch pull, um, which, you know, just that final extension of the body, learning how to, you know, maintain that proper balance, how to guide the bar up the body, 
Um, you know, those, those basic things every once in a while, I'll start with a jump, uh, from that mid thigh position. That's one of those things where it's really a judgment call based on the athlete or the group of athletes you're working with. So the, the jump is just a really simple, basic way to give people an experience, uh, you know, to feel that concurrent, uh, uh, knee and hip extension, you know, that vertical push against the ground with that extension of the hips, all while guiding a bar up the body. Um, and then we refine that to a pull where we're maintaining contact with the floor, but we're essentially mimicking that same motion. Uh, then we'll do a tall muscle snatch, which is just, you know, from that full standing position, it's upper body only pulling the elbows up and out, turning over and punching straight up into that overhead position they already learned. Uh, and so again, that's that that motion under the bar, keeping the bar and the body close, uh, understanding it's a very active, aggressive motion. It's not falling or dropping under the bar and then hoping it lands in the right position. Like there was some kind of divine intervention and the universe placed the bar in your hands perfectly. Um, and then we'll move basically it, it, down to uh, a mid thigh snatch with a couple other little steps. And so it really, the whole idea is just breaking it into those pieces so we can make sure each one is dialed in and everyone understands what's happening. Um, the clean is identical, except that of course, we're learning that turnover to the rack position on the shoulders versus the turnover into the overhead position. Um, and then, and of course, you know, we start with the front squat, that receiving position. And then the jerk, it, it, it seems very different on the surface, but it's really identical. We learn the overhead position. We learn the split position. Um, we learn the rack position, you know, how you're holding that bar on your shoulders. Uh, and then we go from press to push press to power jerk to split jerk um, with a couple, you know, little technical things in there. Like we'll, I'll do a jerk balance to learn how to, you know, step the front foot and the hip through in the split rather than dive the head and chest. Um, and we'll usually do a split jerk behind the neck because that's a simplified bar path. And so really it's, it's just establishing those, those receiving positions, um, and then building from there. And, and the, something I wrote in the first edition of my book 10 plus years ago, uh, was kind of this order of operations that you always have to keep in mind. And it's number one is position. Number two is motion. Number uh, three is speed. Number four is load. So that position is the priority always. Um, and you think about it and you say, well, I want to work on the movement. Well, you can't do the correct movement from an incorrect position because it's a different movement. So if you don't have the correct receiving position or you don't have the correct mid thigh position, you can't do the snatch correctly, right? It's a, it's a different motion. It's an incorrect motion. Um, and you, you don't want to be trying to add maximal speed until you have that position. You have that basic motion. And so I think a lot of people get ahead of themselves and it's like any other thing. People want to do it full speed, full weight right away. And oh, you know, over time it'll just get better. Well, maybe it might, but that's, that's kind of a big gamble you're taking because in the meantime, you're essentially training yourself to do something wrong. It means two years from now when we realize how bad it is, um, you're going to have to go back and do a lot of remediation to try to correct all of it. All right, that's savage information there. Just one thing I wanted to ask there too was um, a question I actually had for you too. When you turn over the snatch, what do you recommend to do with the thumb in terms should it stay hook grip or do you like to let it go? It's, it's real simple in my opinion. If you can maintain or establish the correct overhead position with your hand and wrist while holding the hook grip, then keep the hook grip. Mm. Um, so that's typical for women because they tend to have more slender hands and fingers, a smaller bar and better mobility. Um, it's, it's less common for men, especially big guys. We have like, you know, these thick sausage finger, you know, catcher's mitt hands. Um, and we can't necessarily hit that, that good position. So in that case, you do need to, to slide the hook grip out so that you can establish the right position. So again, position first, movement second. Um, what I do is when I'm teaching someone new, I will teach them how to release the hook grip. Uh, because if you hold the hook grip for the first year, it's, it's tricky to learn how to release it. Uh, but if you learn how to release it, it's really easy to just change your mind and hold it. All you do is hold it. 
yeah, savage stuff. Getting in then to the the most common errors, and just for any listeners to like Greg's third edition of his book is phenomenal. It's uh, like it has like all this in detail in it. So if you haven't got a copy of that and you want to get more into the details here, I would highly recommend that you purchase that. Just want to get into some of the most common errors you see. And just for any of the listeners, Greg has an unbelievable book out that he's he's three editions of it out now. And his third edition is like phenomenally detailed. So everything he's just gone through there with the technical models is in detail in those books and also with the uh, common errors that he sees and corrections. So if you want to get more into the details, that's a phenomenal resource and I'll put that in the show notes for sure. But Greg, just with some of the common errors you see with the snatch clean and the jerk, what do you most commonly see and what would you recommend? Now, I know it's general on a podcast. We know videos and people can't see. Um, so you're going to be general maybe with your answers and it's also going to depend on the individual given their body types, atropometrics, what, what not. But what are the most common issues you see and, and what, what are the most common sort of go-to corrections you're usually having to use? Uh, I'd say with this, the snatch, the most common thing I see these days is a failure to drive vertically with the legs during the pull. Um, and understandably so, people are so enamored with the idea of hip extension um, a lot of them have been taught it's all about hips, hips this, we do kettlebell swings, they sit backward when they squat, you know, all these crazy things. And when it comes to the snatch, it's like they're trying to do explosive hip extension while they're standing on a raft in a pool. Uh, you know, they have no base because their legs aren't driving. Their legs are, it's like they, they look like a marionette who got its strings cut right at the top of the pole. Um, and so the, the analogy with that that I use is, um, it, you know, when you're trying to elevate a bar, accelerate a bar, if you're, if you're not driving with the legs, it's like trying to jump off of a soft surface. You have no base to push against. And so that leg drive is your hard platform to jump off of. So those legs have to keep driving through the ground. They should be oriented vertically as you're extending those hips. So the hips will hyperextend a little bit to bring your shoulders a little bit behind the hip. Um, but those legs should be vertical and they should be straight at the top and because they're still pushing. Um, probably my favorite exercise to help with that is a uh, snatch from power position. Um, and so the way I define that exercise is you are, your, your trunk remains vertical. You bend only at the knees. So essentially you're in a jerk dip position. Uh, the bar is resting in the crease of your hip and you're gonna hold that bottom position before you go. So it's, it's not a counter movement and you're going from a static starting position. Um, and so what that does is that places you in that last moment during a, uh, during a snatch where you would be you know, finalizing that leg drive, finalizing that hip extension. It puts you in a perfectly balanced position with the bar against your body so you can really focus on that upward pull and then that change of direction. Um, we can do the same thing with the clean, uh, but I think, I think with the clean, uh, more commonly is allowing the bar to crash down onto your shoulders. So in other words, as you're moving under the bar and turning the bar over, you get a big separation between the bar and your shoulders. And then it's like sitting near the bottom of a front squat and having someone drop the bar onto you. Um, and so, you know, I, I explain to people, let's think about it this way. Would you rather... Um, do a front squat by, you know, taking the bar out of the rack, getting yourself set nice and tight, doing the squat, or, you know, sit a quarter of the way from the bottom and have me drop it on your shoulders. You know, which one's going to be easier, which one's going to be more successful more of the time. And it's, you know, a pretty obvious answer. Um, so part of that turnover is, you know, the way I describe it is saying, staying connected to the bar. You are always actively doing something to the bar. Your body is always actively doing something. You're not falling. You're not dropping. You're not waiting for the bar to do something. Um, and so I like the, the tall, clean exercise. So in that, the fully extended standing position, um, you're essentially just going to pull against the bar with your arms and move your feet into the squat position. Uh, so it's, it's literally just the downward motion of the clean. You get no upward pull or no upward extension with the legs and the hips hips. And what that does is it allows you to feel that really active and aggressive pull under and turnover. 
but you also are able to isolate that to a large degree so there's less to think about and you can focus more on the actual turnover and how to meet the bar. So as you're bringing your elbows around, you're reaching your chest and shoulders up to meet the bar and you're, you're making sure that you never create a big gap there. Um, with the jerk, with the split jerk specifically, the biggest issue by far is, is people stopping the leg drive earlier and, and basically diving their whole body forward onto that front leg. So they end up, you know, with 70% of their weight on the front foot, hardly anything on the back foot. Uh, hips are behind the bar and the head and shoulders are leaning way forward. So they don't have a good structure. They don't have good balance and they haven't elevated the bar adequately to, to jerk really big weights. Um, so doing a push press or a power jerk plus a split jerk is a really good way to help improve that. Um, so with the push press and the, the power jerk, you're really forced to, uh, you know, remain balanced and, and drive vertically. And with the push press, you're going to tend to drive a little longer. Uh, and so you're basically, you know, doing that immediately before the split jerk, you're able to try to replicate that in the split jerk. So you're going to drive all the way up before you split, um, and, and, you know, keep your hips under the bar and try to land with about a 50, 50 balance in that split. That's amazing information. Thanks so much for giving that detail. What are some of the most common myths that you're constantly having to uh, dispel when it comes to Olympic lifting, be that now with the technical models or with programming, you can take this answer whatever way you want. Oh man. I don't know if I've really thought about that much, like all these other answers. So I, I, I think one of the, th there, there's a couple things like over the years that I've constantly done battle with. And one of them is the hips versus legs thing that I kind of just alluded to. Um, and, and you have people who are convinced that it's all hips or it's all legs. Neither one is going to work. You need both. You need them working in concert, um, equally aggressively and completely. Um, and so I think usually what the, the issues come down to someone going to one extreme or the other, when in reality, it's usually a, a pretty good balance. Um, and so anytime you have someone saying, no, it is 100% this, the other thing is 100% wrong. You can pretty much guarantee that what they're saying makes no sense. Um, as far as programming goes, I don't, I don't know that I can think of any myths exactly, but there's so much contention on the topic. Um, I think because there are so many different things that have been successful um, and it, it's whatever the, the most recently successful thing that someone sees is, that's the answer. That's the key that they're missing, right? So like uh, they'll see someone who works up to a heavy single squat every single day and they just, they, they were very successful. So like, that's the key. That's what I'm not doing right. I have to squat every single day and they do it and they die. Um, or, you know, they, there's someone else who, okay, well, um, we always, uh, snatch and clean from the blocks. Oh, well, I don't, I don't snatch and clean from the blocks. That must be what I'm missing. So they snatch and clean from the blocks only. Then they start trying to lift from the floor and they don't even know how to get the bar from the floor to the knee. They're all over the place. They're shifting position. They're out of balance. Um, and, and so I think, I guess the underlying myth, so to speak, would be that, you know, there are just a handful of very simple secrets, right? That there are, there are secrets out there that, you know, some Ukrainian lifter or some Chinese lifter or coach has the secret to weightlifting. And, you know, if I could only get that secret, you know, every, I'd be so much better. I could make it to the world championships. And I think it's, it's been very interesting in the last couple of years um, when a lot of these, um, you know, international lifters and coaches have finally gotten a hold of Instagram or YouTube. Um, and so people of course are clamoring for these secrets and it's very interesting to see and, and kind of reassuring to see that what they're teaching is no different than what the, you know, the top American coaches have been teaching for years. It's the same stuff. And I think people forget or never really understood that even going back decades, American coaches have interacted with foreign coaches and lifters. You know, we used to go to world championships. It's not a new thing. We used to go to Olympics. That's not a new thing. And so there was always an exchange of information. 
Um, and there are always fundamental principles that people are going to arrive at independently as well. Um, and so to, to see that, wow, there really aren't weird secrets. Like we're really not missing anything except for maybe, uh, you know, drug testing issue, which is a whole can of worms. Um, there, there's no secret to programming. There's no secret to technique, uh, which is, which is funny too, because you'll see people, I mean, someone will post, uh, you know, a video or a photo and it'll have the, the simplest advice, like, you know, hold the bar this way. And people will absolutely lose their minds over like, this is the greatest thing ever. It's so cool. Like we finally understand it. And I'm, I'm sitting there looking at it and going, I know coaches who said that 30 years ago in the U S like, this is not something new. It's, it was, it's this weird thing that people have where like, well, Americans aren't as successful as the Chinese, so they must have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, so I'll just wait till the Chinese guy says it and then I'll believe it. Mm. Um, not understanding that they've already heard that same thing a million times and just have refused to acknowledge that it was correct. Uh, and so that, that's been a very bizarre experience and a little frustrating to, to say the least. Um, but so I, I think that that's probably the biggest myth I would say is that there's some secret out there that, you know, once you get it, you know, that's going to, your, your weightlifting career is just going to take off and you got it all squared away. Yeah. There's that kind of saying like profits aren't accepted in their own land. So <laughs> yeah, there you, you know, go. Yeah. Like sure. You ever know you, you, if you ever give advice to a family member, and they hear it from a completely external uh, resource, and they go, "Oh, look, this person said this." Like I've been saying it for years, but like they're oh, never, yeah. they're never going to take it from you, like because like it's just because they know who you are, and like you know, just like they have like there's no novelty to you. It's kind of right. the same. It's like because an American coach said something, it didn't come with a with a fancy Russian accent, or it didn't come from the Chinese weightlifting system, or right. you know, yeah, it, it didn't come with this like little kind of ribbon on it you know like oh this looks mysterious and good as all like but that's exactly what he just said right yeah yeah so uh, I, I think another thing too is that uh and you you'll probably resonate with this and you can expand on this if you want is that i think a lot of people you, you kind of touched on it slightly where like you know the, the, the example you gave of someone's you know snatch balls from, from the from the from the blocks and you know like people will see like certain lifters that they follow do certain exercises and say oh i must start doing that but not realizing that what that individual that they're watching needs to improve their performance is more than likely going to be very different to what they need as individuals to improve their performance. Right. So like I remember Chad Wesley Smith gave a great example where Ily Ilium was over uh, doing a seminar and someone went up and asked him like, Oh, what's your training? Like, what are you doing now? And like Chad was like, this guy was like young. He's like 18, 19. And like Chad says, Chad was like saying that what the young guy should ask was, what did you do? I think it was even actually clock off. He might have been asking. It was, it was one of the clock off really. But he was like, Chad was like, what the young fella should ask is, what were you doing when you were my age? Right. Exactly. Because you know, basically the young fella, he's at like chapter one of his Olympic lifting journey. And he's going up saying like, what do you do now? Where like Ily Ilium or it was clock off one the other. They're like on chapter 32. And he's sure. like, tell, tell me what you're doing now in chapter 32. And it's like, yeah, but you have to go all the way back to it. Right. It's not going to work for you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, th I think that's another thing probably as well. And oh, absolutely. So you had a fairly, um, a, a fairly serious shoulder injury. Um, since we last spoke in, in between those periods of time. Um, one, one question that came to my mind today, was that why you, you pumped out the third edition because you had time on your hands? Because like that third edition's a monster. Uh, no. I, honestly, I don't remember the timeline on that. I guess it was after my shoulder injury. Yeah, I was just, it just came into my mind. I was like, maybe that's, maybe it was like he was, you know, I, no. I, I got this image like, and you're like, fuck my shoulder. He's like, well, what I'm going to do right now is write this beast. Or rewrite no, you know what? I, okay, I remember now what it was because the, the, the photo stuff became a problem. I had, I had already essentially written the third edition Oh wow! when I blew out my shoulder and I hadn't taken all the photos. Uh, and so I couldn't. I couldn't demo a lot of the photos that hadn't been taken because of my, I couldn't do anything with my shoulder. Yeah. So that's why there are different people all of a sudden, you know, in certain demos where normally I would have been demonstrating them. So mm -hmm. it, yeah, it, it had been largely done at that point uh, writing wise. Cause it's a, uh, it's a monster. Like you are a production machine. Like the, the only other person I've seen with like the same amount of like 
just material in terms of like just output is Eric Cressy. Like that guy's a robot. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> you know I mean, he's been blogging since 2003 and it's just like blog every week consistently. And the amount yeah. of products he's put down, you're the same too. I mean, your production quant- quality and quantity is, is immense. And again, I'll link everything up in the show notes for anyone who is listening, who has not come across your material yet. And if you haven't, shame on you. But now you know. Uh, Greg, just go, so going into that, actually, because I, I do want to ask about return to performance um, protocol. So maybe even just take us through your own journey there with the shoulder, because listen mm-hmm. to your actual last podcast that you've done on your own podcast, the Weightlifting Life podcast, which people should listen to. It's very funny. With Ursula, you were talking kind of about your progression through bringing your shoulder back. You, know, you were saying that you were actually giving the example of like the, the, the shoulder mobility screen from the FMS scratch test and you were saying like oh man like that test was a nightmare when he came back first so that maybe it's possible yeah maybe yeah. just talk us through your journey and your re- return to the to, to the to the platform and um and maybe even give us some examples maybe of some athletes you might have worked with and like so some common injuries you might see and, and how you know you've gone about bringing people back from those and you can start with your own because i think it's interesting um yeah so with my shoulder uh i dislocated it and in the process uh tore the labrum almost all the way around, almost the, the full circumference um, and, and uh, full thickness supraspinatus tear. So it was six anchors in there to repair it. I was immobilized for about two months. Um, and, you know, the surgeon told me before the surgery was like, listen, the biggest problem is going to be regaining mobility. Um, and I, I've always had really good shoulder mobility and stability. I never had an sh- issue with my shoulders prior to that injury. It was a total freak thing. Um, and, and so that was turned out to be really true. Uh, and so when I came out of that sling, I man, I could not move that arm much at all. It was brutal. Uh, and so it took, I mean, the surgeon told me, he's like, it's, it's going to be a full year before you're lifting on a barbell again. And that, that was about right. Uh, and so it was, it was very, very slow process. Um, early on, it was all about trying to regain just a baseline of mobility. Um, and so I was working with a physical therapist and by the time she got me to about 160 degrees of shoulder flexion, so well short of what you really need to be uh, good overhead. Um, she basically was like, I don't know what else to do with you. You know, this is kind of with a normal patient, 160 degrees is good. Like you're done, you're out of here. Um, and so past that, it was in, in something I, I discussed with Earthla is that it was really the key was, was the combination of strengthening and uh, stretching. So you know, putting those both together uh, because as you know, I think people are becoming more and more aware, um, a lot of times what manifests as immobility is a lack of stability or a lack of strength. Uh, and so with the shoulder, I think that's particularly true because it's, it's a, a relatively fragile joint. And, and if you don't have that stability, your body's going to kind of shut it down to protect itself. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of the classic, you know, band and, and little plate exercises, you know, your external rotation, IYTs, the, you know, the, um, subscap kind of things, um, or, or serratus things are, were, were helpful. But then also, um, once I started actually moving things overhead, that was really key for me. Once I could actually start, um, you know, doing some kind of snatching or overhead squat or, or, you know, pressing overhead, that was really, really where it took off again. The problem I encountered was that I got to a point where it was healed enough. I felt confident enough that I was lifting again, you know, actual snatch, clean and jerk weightlifting training um, and starting to push the weights. Um, But my mobility wasn't a hundred percent. So this was my left shoulder that I hurt. So my right elbow was compensating for that lack of mobility a bunch. And I, uh, ended up really screwing that up badly. And it took three PRP shots in almost a year to get that back. And that's still not a hundred percent. Um, and so it's essentially, I, I think I just jumped into it too hard too soon, uh, which is the typical athlete thing. You know, we're, we're stubborn We're we don't want to slow down. We don't want to stop. It had already been a year plus, you know, since I'd been able to train normally. So I'm, you know, I'm going stir crazy. Um, and so 
the, the best advice I can give when it comes to that stuff is, you know, take it step by step, check that stuff off the list before you move on to the next step, because it, it may, if you're rushing it, it may seem like, oh, wow, yeah, I'm making faster progress. This is great. But, you know, nine times out of 10, you're going to end up having to take steps backward because you pushed it too hard, too fast. And so you, you it, as hard as, as it is, you really have to keep that long-term perspective in mind. And, you know, to, to use the, the old war parlance, you got to, you know, win the war, not just individual battles. Uh, and, and so taking that time to get that baseline mobility back, I would say is number one. Uh, number two, you start, once you're at a level of mobility where you can actually do some movement, um, really focusing on stability and, you know, isometric strength, um, you know, whatever your current end range of motion is, you know, isometric strength there, then moving, you know, of course, more dynamically uh, with, with slower movements and, you know, very last you're coming back to those more uh, uh, speed oriented or, or kind of ballistic motions that are going to be the most taxing and, and just really paying attention to how what you're doing is affecting the rest of your body too because I was overly focused on my shoulder or oh, my shoulder feels fine yeah the mobility is not good I can't put my shoulder blade in the right place overhead but it doesn't hurt it's not getting worse uh, meanwhile I was ignoring the fact that my elbow was hurting for six months and then eight months and then a year before I did anything about it and by that time you know you go in with the ultrasound and there was just black everywhere you know that all the the common flexor tendon all that stuff was just rotted away basically so it, it, that took a huge amount of time to come back to that and during that time of course I couldn't train normally uh, so I lost a whole nother bunch of time and so it's been three years now since that injury um, and I never really made it back to 100%. And a, a big part of that, to be fair, was that I've got a lot of other things going on in my life. So I wasn't able to, to commit to it. I'm also, you know, almost 39 years old, which doesn't help. Um, you know, surprisingly enough, I, I don't recover as well as I, I did in my 20s. Um, but so I, I think I really screwed myself on that by trying to rush the process and not being as aware of the rest of my body as I should have been during the process. Yeah. I heard you, you said in your last podcast too, you were like, I'm not a patient person. <laughs> no, not with uh, that. I, uh, I definitely, uh, think some, some stem cell, stem cell therapy is, is what, is what might, uh, might help you out there. There's a, a guy, Eric Marola. He's a documentary, um, director. He's the guy actually behind the uh, Brzezinski movies, but he was on, um, Jason Farouge's podcast and he's another podcast out there or, or sorry he's another documentary out there Eric Marola the name now I'm, I'm don't quote me this is it called the God Gene I think it could be the God Gene but basically it's a, it's a documentary on stem cell therapy and he says he goes over to an Eastern European country like every year costs him $18,000 and he gets all his whole body like <laughs> done with stem cells and he's like feels like 100 bucks like but oh. his, his documentary is basically like one of the opening scenes and is a fellow with Parkinson's and he's sitting down and like he looks like he's Parkinson's he's shaking and he's in bits and he and he's like you know they're like one hour or two hours after stem cell therapy he's walking around brand new shampoo like he don't know, mad stuff like so the, I haven't fully watched the documentary but like apparently stem cells is going to be like just like the way the future but of course is the whole fucking you know the whole religious thing around it and embryos right. and, you know so I mean that's that's a conversation for another day with someone else probably like yeah. probably like sam <laughs> i'll get sam harris on he can rant on it um listen that's brilliant stuff just before i i move on and, and wrap up um that that's your own your own sort of journey with your own injury and, and rehab have you had to bring any of your own athletes back from any injuries before yeah uh fortunately not many times and not super serious mm. Um, I, I've been lucky and I think it's probably because as a coach, I'm fairly conservative. Um, I, you know, I talk to athletes and, you know, when something hurts, you need to tell me yeah. so that we can figure out on the spot, is this an injury or is it discomfort? Is it something we can work through without aggravating and turning it into an injury? Or is it something where we need to stop what we're doing right now before it gets really serious? Um, so the most recent thing is, is my 59 kilo lifter, Lily, 
uh, last going into last nationals, we were snatching normal snatch day. She was doing on the minute snatches. They were looking fine. Um, she did one and she was kind of like, Oh man, it kind of bugged my shoulder. It wasn't anything like catastrophic or anything. Um, and so she did a few more reps and then by the next day, her shoulder was just killing her, um, to the point where she could not snatch for, you know, so I think we were like four weeks out from nationals. She didn't snatch for three weeks and then only did a few snatches in the week leading into national championships. Um, and so she had it checked out by one of the, one of the doctors at nationals who was like, yeah, you, you probably have some minor tearing in there. Um, and so following nationals, we took another several weeks off of snatching and doing anything overhead and really just kind of went back, um, and focused first on, on, she, she doesn't have great shoulder mobility, which is bananas. Cause she was a pretty high level gymnast, uh, years ago. Mm. Um, but, you know, focus on trying to reestablish as much mobility as possible in the thoracic spine and in the shoulders. Um, but then really focusing on um, upper back strength and the overhead stability. So introducing a lot more, uh, you know, rowing exercises for her, um, you know, whether it was like one arm dumbbell rows, ring rows, pull ups, uh, bent rows, you know, cable rows on a bench, regular bench rows with a cambered bar but really getting that uh, scapular retraction motion strengthened. Um, of course, all the band stuff I talked about earlier, she does daily. Um, and then a lot of overhead carries. So um, initially we had to start with a jerk grip because the snatch grip was still bothering her shoulder, but uh, an overhead carry with a barbell uh, with you know weights hanging on like the thin red bands. So you're doing a carry with that. The, the, the weights are swinging and bouncing a little bit and, you know, really focusing on holding the bar stable with the upper back, not with the shoulders and with the elbows, but really making that upper back, the focus and that foundation, um, doing, you know, one arm overhead carries with, uh, you know, dumbbells or kettlebells. Um, we did a lot of handstand walking. Uh, so basically anything we could do that wasn't painful, and that was strengthening that upper back, improving the mobility and, and improving the stability of her shoulder, and then very gradually reintroducing snatching. Um, you know, we started with muscle snatches in overhead squats, so that's nice and light. Um, all her snatch stuff, overhead stuff, we were, you know, sitting in the bottom of the squat for three seconds and really just introducing gradually that way. And so that took several weeks to kind of get back to where she could actually snatch somewhat regularly. Um, and so this was nationals was in May. So she's been basically a hundred percent for a, a few months now. Um, but I think, you know, I learned from my experience with my shoulder um, it, trying to be patient and let's not, yes, we have the American open in, in several months, but it's not going to matter if your shoulder is still fucked up. Um, and you're still in pain and we can't, you know, we're snatching 70% the whole time. There's no point in rushing it. We're not going to get to hundred percent by then anyway. Uh, and so part of it too, as a coach, at least is reassuring the athlete or reassuring your client, like, Hey, this kind of paced out, uh, process is going to be way more effective for you long-term as frustrating as it is. I know you want to start snatching again tomorrow. Um, but we, again, that long-term perspective, we need to be prepared in December for the American open, not next Friday for some random training day. Uh, and so really trying to rebuild that, that foundation of stability and mobility so that we can maintain it and not end up in this same position again. Has your own injury and rehab experience given you greater levels of empathy now for people with their own injuries? Um, I would say so, but I don't think I was really lacking any empathy with that prior. I, I, I think, yeah. again, I've, I've always been pretty conservative and I've always been very good at, at making sure to distinguish between injuries and pain and discomfort. Yeah. Right. Now I'm, I'm not, there's a big difference between being tough and being stupid. Yeah. Uh, and as an athlete, it's critical that you understand that, you know, being tough is like, Oh, you know, my whole body is achy, you know, I've got some tendonitis, you know, whatever, uh, you know, I'm, I'm tired. Tough is, is kind of pushing through that when you need to being stupid is I hurt my shoulder, 
but I don't want to stop training at hundred percent. So I'm just going to keep training the exact same way until my shoulder disintegrates and I can never lift again. That's just being stupid. There's nothing tough about that. Yeah. And just, uh, on my last two questions to you there, one, I absolutely was not implying that you injured your athletes. I probably should have asked like, you know, when maybe an athlete with an injury comes to you, you know, cause I, Oh I, yeah. No, I didn't, I didn't take it that way. Yeah. And by empathy, I suppose the word I probably should use is maybe understanding in that no doubt you have empathy before, but I know like myself now, I, touch wood i'm actually here to wood table. i've never really had any devastating injury mm-hmm. per se but like i i did tear a bit of cartilage in my knee one time and, and that put me back for maybe six seven eight weeks and it just gave me more like fuck this is actually what it's like to actually have to like adjust training and like right. you know, like there were things i wasn't actually able to do you know it just gave me more like so you know i never you, you know like uh, i never given a second thought like and even though like i've had lots of friends who i played sport with who had injuries and were out for long periods of time and you know, you never really think about it until you have your own. Like, fuck, this is actually what it's kind of like to be, you yeah. know, a little bit disabled in, in one capacity, you know. That's kind of more maybe understanding more than empathy. I'm not saying that you didn't have empathy initially. Um, just going back to your programming there, uh, I remember last time we spoke, I actually loved your sort of overview of your programming model. So, like, let's just say, and I think that was the way I worded the question the last time was like, you know, you 12 weeks, 16 weeks, whatever it is, to, uh, to a competition. Um, how do you usually map out your training? I believe last time we spoke, you, you know, you kind of do have like an accumulation, intensification, and mm-hmm. a peaking model. Um, could you maybe talk us through like your your macro cycle, your your, your meso cycles, and then your actual weekly structure as well? Like, could you give us like sure. a brief overview of that? That'd be great. So d- depending on the calendar, um, typically my ideal situation is to be able to work with four-week meso cycles, you know, in a, a 12 to 16-week macro cycle. Uh, of course, it doesn't always work out that way. So you got to get creative sometimes, you know, sometimes you're going to have to squeeze in a couple three week mesocycles, or maybe you have to start with a five or six week. Um, really, it really just depends again on the calendar. And, you know, in, in my case, we're always working around uh, competition dates. Um, so in any case, we're going to start with some kind of uh, preparation phase or, or, or accumulation phase, depending on how you um but I always like the word extensification, mm. uh, I, although I never use it. Sounds uh, a little too presumptuous or not presumptuous, pretentious. Um, and in that time, what we're going to be doing is, you know, accumulating volume. So that means, you know, we're going to be doing uh, higher reps, lower weight, um, more technique oriented work with the snatch and clean and jerk. So, we're, we're probably not going to be doing very much straight up snatch and clean and jerk. It's going to be variations. So hang blocks, um, you know, complexes, multiple reps, things like that. Um, but those things are going to be um, individualized for that athlete. So uh, while I have kind of a, a template of what I'm going to use is, okay, well, you know, this day I'm going to do some kind of snatch exercise what that exercise actually is, is going to be specific to that athlete and what they, that person needs at that time. Um, so I don't have like a set program. I kind of have a, a, a template idea in my mind. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of position work. So instead of, you know, maybe just basic snatch pulls, we're going to be doing, you know, halting snatch deadlift on a riser. So we're, we're improving the leg strength and that postural strength off the floor, we're improving the postural strength to be able to stay over the bar longer in the pole. So, you know, you look at um, it, you're, you're, you're fulfilling um, kind of categories, I guess you could say. So that's my pulling category. I have my competition lift category. So I'll have a variation that is appropriate for that time and that athlete. And I have my pulling category. So that's some kind of pulling or deadlift variation that is appropriate for that time and that athlete. And then you have, you know, your, your squatting strength, your overhead strength, all those different things. Um, and so that's the time for the technique work, the strength work and the volume. Um, so usually we'll have, uh, I ideally kind of two, uh, meso cycles of that kind of thing. And the second one of course would be a little bit lower volume, uh, you know, higher intensity, fewer reps, most likely different exercises. Uh, and you know, you, and you'll see some sort of logical progression. So if we have say that halting snatch deadlift on the riser in that first, uh, mesocycle, maybe in the second mesocycle, we're going to have, um, uh, 
just snatch pull on the riser. So we're still keeping that, you know, that deficit in the pull, but now we're working on a little more speed and that extension. Um, but again, that can really depend on the athlete. Maybe we'll have pause at the knee or pause one inch off the floor or whatever it is. Um, and, and we'll, over that time, of course, we'll progressively move closer and closer to the competition lift. So just a straight up snatch and clean and jerk, uh, working from either higher reps or complexes or things like that. Um, and then the, you know, the competition phase of that last few weeks, um, the focus is really on snatch and clean and jerk and being able to snatch and clean and jerk for singles consistently and heavy. Um, and so of course we maintain squatting and pulling, um, but those things are going to make up a smaller percentage of the total training volume, of course. Um, and so it's, it's more at that, at that point, really it's more maintenance, uh, than building with that strength stuff. Uh, and that's, that's to kind of strip away some of that fatigue that you've accumulated over the past eight weeks to be able to put more focus and more energy into the snatching cleaner jerk and using that strength and that position improvement that you've made uh, and, and applying that to the snatch and clean and jerk. So I, you know, I may use, um, on the minute snatch and clean and jerk. I may do, um, waves. Those are kind of my two go-tos when it comes to that stuff. So with the waves, uh, we'll work up to a heavy single drop back down to say about 90% of that work back up and try to beat that original heavy single and do that two or three times. Um, and those are ways where we can get a lot of exposure uh, two heavy single snatch and clean and jerk, um, and also prepare for competition in a number of ways where, you know, sometimes you're going to have to go really fast in your warm up. So those on the minute lifts are really good for that, both for conditioning, but also just mentally being ready. Like, Oh, I can I can take a 95% lift with one minute rest. I know I can do that, uh, with the waves, you know, especially, um, you know, at the national level, international level, you, you tend to have lifters very stacked up at similar weights. And so even if you take a, say a three kilo jump, uh, between attempts in the snatch, you could have literally a 15 minute wait between attempts. You can't just sit there and wait. Um, you know, you have to keep moving. So being able to drop the weight a little bit and then work back up and still have energy to go out there and make your next attempt, uh, is really important. So that's kind of the, the, the outline of the way I'm going to structure a, a program for competition that's savage and just with the uh extensification <laughs> i like that mm -hmm. extensification blocks uh, essentially you're you're tailoring that to work on the individual's weaknesses always yeah, and the, yeah. the whole program is always tailored towards the individual's weaknesses so again you have that boilerplate pr program but you have to even individualize it yeah uh, exactly. I'm, a, I'm a i'm a big believer in that and if you look at if you look at all the different athletes i program for you're going to have some of them whose programs look very similar. They're almost interchangeable. And that's of course, because they just happen to be similar uh, in terms of what they can handle and what they need. But then you're going to have other programs where they look like they're from two different coaches. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my, my thing is that I, I want to use whatever is going to be most successful. I don't really care what it is. I'm not necessarily wed to a certain philosophy or method. I just want to, be successful i don't i don't care you know how i get there i think the last time we spoke to you said you ideally like to have a five day weekly cycle so it, uh, is it was it monday through thursday or friday off and then saturday was a little more sort of a, a little more like did they kind of do more of the specific lifts if you like it um, again you can correct me here now when, I, when you jump in and was it that you know you, you kind of alternate again it's going to individualize i say to the individual mm -hmm. but the kind of general template and then was it also to you kind of like to go like more of a you know higher load slower velocity day heavier day basically and then alternate it with kind of lighter faster days so it's kind mm -hmm. of like the is that still sort of a standardish template I yeah, depend on yeah. tip so five to six days a week depending on the athlete is pretty typical i i've had a couple lifters who have trained four days a week but it was not because that's what I thought was best for them. It was because of life circumstances yeah. that dictated that was all they could do. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's always disappointing. <laughs> you know, it's like, God, it'd be so much easier if I just had that fifth day. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, yes, typically we're going to alternate daily, um, a, a higher volume, higher intensity day 
with a lower volume, lower intensity day. And so for, for example, that, that first day is probably going to be a competition lift focus. So some kind of competition lift, some kind of pull, some kind of squat, that would be pretty standard. Yeah. And then a following day, uh, might be a competition lift variation, like a power or a hang or block or, you know, whatever that's, that's going to be naturally lighter, faster, uh, more technical, um, or we, that's a good day where we do more overhead work. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of different ways of structure. I don't always do it exactly like that, but it always is that basic theme where you, you kind of want, uh, you know, a quote unquote hard day next to a moderate or easier day. And because you need that kind of built in little bit of recovery as you get through the week. And then another question I had asked you before was the order of exercises and you get, you gave a great response, but just want to see if you've changed any thoughts or again, and you can expand for some of the listeners who, who didn't obviously hear our first conversation a few years back. Well, yeah. I mean, you start with the basic, which is all, all other things being equal. You want to start with exercises that are more technical and more speed oriented. Yeah. Right. So and that's, you want to do that stuff when you're the freshest, you have the most focus and the most energy. And then you progressively move towards the slower, more strength oriented to the exercise so then let's say you would have snatch then snatch pulls then back squats yeah right there there's your normal progression um but again if you're looking at an individual case um you may let's say someone is a very strong puller but a very weak squatter yes you may then switch the order of the pulls and the squats yeah right? so yeah. you're gonna squat first then do pulls afterwards yeah you have someone who's an extremely weak squatter, you might squat first and then snatch. Mm. Um, and you know, there, there are other reasons to squat first. Um, you know, there's the whole post activation potentiation argument, which I think a lot of times is a bit suspect the way people apply it. Um, but it, you know, it, you also have kind of just the idea that if you, if you force someone to squat first prior to a snatch, a clean or a jerk, you're basically moving them into that in a fatigued state. So if, if they're technically sound enough, now what you're doing is forcing them to, to really turn on the gas when they don't feel amazing. Um, yeah. And so you're, you're forcing them uh, to be aggressive, to be focused, and uh, I, I believe physically to be able to recruit uh, more, more and higher threshold motor units um, in order to, you know, develop that, that strength and that speed and that explosiveness. Um, and then of course that carries over into later in competition or, or when you move those squats out of the front, um, of course that should bring their performance up, um, because you, you developed that capacity and now you're stripping that stuff away to actually, um, uh, execute it. Brilliant. Brilliant. And just final question there on that, on that five day template, is it like, um, and again, in an ideal situation and, and just to also carry on from your last answer just there, it always is going to depend on the individual. Like we, we both know that just, just, just to say that to anyone, you know, it, it's, it's context and we need to know more. We need to know about the individual to really give a true answer. So I, I just want to say, I really appreciate Greg, like, you know, putting out, the, the, the answers he's given I'm not saying not like you know because you easily can be like well it depends but at least you've, you've tried like to like listen this is you know what you can do but just keep in mind it's always going to depend on the individual so I do appreciate that but just with that five day template is it usually Monday through Thursday with Friday off and then it was Saturday like more of a competition-ish type day was yep. that correct yeah, yeah. That, that's that's typical um, and I got that template from my coach, Mike Bergner. Yeah. It was also used a lot by John Thrush and Kyle Pierce and a big, big reason. Well, there's, there's a few reasons. Number one, I think it's really important for an athlete to snatch and clean and jerk heavy back to back on the same day regularly. Mm -hmm. If you are a competitive weightlifter, because if you go through your training all the time, well, I only snatch on, you know, one day and then I only clean and jerk on another day. You get to competition, you get finished with your snatches and you're, oh shit, I, I got to go out there and, and try to make a PR clean and jerk. I'm tired. I'm not focused. I've kind of, you know, I've hit the wall. And so if, if it's a, a normal thing or Saturdays, typically, you know, you go in and you try to do a heavy single snatch, heavy single clean and jerk. Um, it's so routine that it's, it's, you don't have to think about it. You're not worried about it. You're prepared for it mentally and physically. And there's something to be said about having to go in on a Saturday 
to work to a heavy single snatch and clean and jerk when you are just smoked. You know, you know like you're, you're warming up like I'm going to hit 60%. There is no way I'm going to hit a big lift. Um, and being able to mentally fight through that kind of doubt and that lack of enthusiasm or, or energy. Um, and there's going to be days when you only hit 85%. And, and what I remind people in those cases is that's fine. A heavy single is all relative. Did it feel heavy? Yes. That's a heavy single. Um, and, and so the thing is, if you go into it in a fatigued state, that 85%, um, is essentially doing the same thing as say a 95%, 98%. If you're totally fresh, you know, it has a very similar effect on your body and on you mentally. Um, so it's not, it's not like there's something wrong with you if you only hit 85% one day. Mm, absolutely. Savage answers. Just, uh, uh, something that came to my mind there too, is like, like, uh, you're at a competition and like, you have to, you know, you have to hit a heavy clean jerk after snatch and like, you want your body to be like, Oh, it's just, it's just Saturday. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I've said that exact thing to so many lifters who are, you know, very nervous in competition. It's just another Saturday. You're going to go snatch and clean and jerk. You just have a bigger, you have a bigger platform so you can fuck it up and run around more if you need to. Yeah. Um, I hate to ask this, but the only reason I ask this is because you gave such golden information there. And just when we lost the connection, you, I got your technical model for the snatch. Mm -hmm. Would, would you mind just doing the clean and the jerk again? Um, sure. Uh, listen, you can just be quick because again, once you cover the snatch, it's similar enough. It's just, yep. cause, it's just again because the information's so good, and the fucking our internet was so shitty there. And I can, <laughs> I can imagine like Kiva, from, Kiva, she she does the the like the post edit and all this, and she would just like she would give an extra like there was noises and clicking, and then you have to, have to cut out that bit. And I was just like, oh no. Oh yeah, so, yeah, you could just yeah, you could just go there again. The, what I t when people are taking like the certification test that I give. Uh, I give them a hint and I say, if you know the snatch progression, you can figure out the clean progression. Yeah. If you have like any sense about you, yeah. uh, because it is essentially the same. It's the same principles. So we start with the receiving position, of course, the front squat. Uh, and then from there we move to, you know, the extension from mid thigh. We might do a jump. Hopefully at that point you don't need it. If you've already learned the, the snatch, you shouldn't need it. Mm. Um, so it's just a clean pull from mid thigh. And we go to what I call a, a rack delivery. This is another one of those things that just got posted by one of these international lifters. And it's revolutionary now, even though I've been teaching it for 12 years. Uh, but that, but Greg, you know, you're that's American. Actually, American, just, Americans don't know how to... Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's the problem is you're American. You guys don't know how to... Yeah. Learn. Yeah. I, I had someone say... I, I posted a, a warm-up, a dynamic warm-up for weightlifting maybe a year ago. And some guy's like, wow, this looks exactly like Coach Ma's warm-up. You know, the Chinese... And I, I didn't respond to it, but I was just thinking like, well, that's weird. It's, it's more likely that he took it from me considering I published this 10 years ago and his video is a month old. Uh, of course, he didn't get it from me just like I didn't get it from him. It's obvious shit. You know what I mean? It's like two, you know, two different civilizations invented a wheel independently of each other. They didn't like, you know, fly across the ocean and, and, and you know, it wasn't industrial espionage. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in any case, we go to that rack delivery drill, which is starting with the elbows high and outside and literally just turning over that bar, turning the elbows over and bringing the bar smoothly into that rack position, and which goes back to what we talked about earlier with the bar crashing. So immediately when we're learning the clean, we're learning how to, to bring the bar and the body together smoothly and maintain that connection. Um, then we do a tall muscle clean. So in the tall standing position, you're pulling the elbows up and out and then turning it over. So basically you're just adding distance to that rack delivery drill. Then we go to a tall clean. So now you're doing that same upper body motion, but you're actually moving your body under the bar. You're moving your feet into that squat stance, uh, and receiving that bar smoothly and tightly in that squat popping right up. And then of course you just clean from mid thigh. Uh, so again, same principle, same, uh, you know, logical progression as the snatch, uh, with the jerk, same idea. We learn the overhead position, which conveniently enough is the same as the snatch with a narrower grip. Um, and then we press, you know, we learn the rack position and, and we press. So how to get the bar, uh, from in front of your body in that rack position to behind your body, you know, we want it over the back of the neck with the head and the chest pushed through a little bit. So basically learning how to 
do that motion with, with no excessive bar path. You know, you're not pushing the bar around your head. Uh, you're not leaning your head way back out of the way. Just, you know, you're trying to pass the two with as little extraneous movement as possible. Um, then we go to a, a push press. So we're learning how to actually drive the bar up with the legs. The, the push press dip and drive is identical to the jerk or should be. It's not always with some people, but it should be. Um, then we go to a power jerk. Well, I take that back. We'll do a tall power jerk sometimes. So we'll, ba we'll basically start with the bar at about the forehead level mm. and just do that final foot movement and punch under. Right. So it's, it's like the equivalent of a tall snatch or a tall clean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we'll go to a power jerk or a push jerk, depending on, you know, what they need. One moves the feet, one doesn't. Um, and so now we're learning the basic motion of the jerk, the dip, the drive up, the transition to pushing with the arms, um, and then the motion of the body under the bar. Then we'll go to, uh, a, a, a split jerk from behind the neck. So now we have the basic split jerk motion, but the bar path is simplified. The bar goes directly up. The body goes directly down. There's no movement. Uh, you know, the trunk doesn't have to, to incline forward. It's already set exactly where it should be. Your balance should be set. You land 50, 50 on the feet in the split position. Then we'll go to a jerk balance, which you're basically starting in a two thirds length split position with the bar in your front rack. You're dipping, you're driving the bar up overhead as you step just the front foot into the full split. So what that's doing is teaching people to move into the split um, with the front foot and the hip versus you know diving the head and the chest through, which pulls your back leg and your hip out from under the bar, makes you short step so that you're in a, a horrible position to support the weight. So we learn how to do that split, split properly. Then we do the split jerk, regular old split jerks. So, Again, same thing. We learn the receiving position. We learn, we break the motion into the pieces that are important for, for learning the motor skill and teaching the principles. And then we put it all together at the end. And do you teach boat jerks or do you make a decision get on the individual saying, I think you'd be better off with a squat jerk versus a split jerk? Well, you always teach the split jerk. There, there's a reason that 95% of competitive weightlifters use the split jerk and it, and uh, it's the most stable. It allows yeah. the, the most correction. It allows you to get low and still be able to recover. It requires the least mobility. Um, and so you always want to start someone with the split jerk. Okay. And over time, if you find that there is a really compelling reason to change to a power jerk, or in the extremely rare case, I've still never had someone who should do it, a uh, squat jerk, um, then you change. And so I, a, a good example is I, I had a girl, a 48 kilo lifter who was just convinced that she would be a better power jerker than a split jerker. Now I said, I, I promise that is not going to solve the problem. And she just wouldn't, wouldn't back off it. So I'll tell you, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you a month. We'll do only power jerks. Um, and we'll see how it goes and, and you'll make the decision. Then she made it like a week and a half and was like, okay, yeah, no, I, I, I want to go back to split jerking, you know, because it's, it's typically very obvious. It's not, you, there's no test for it, but if, I mean, if you have someone who is a very elastic, you know, they, they have a very quick and shallow dip and drive and they're able to drive the bar extremely high. That's the perfect candidate for a power jerk or a push jerk. They don't need the split because they don't need to get under the bar so much. Um, if you have someone who isn't great at elevating bar, uh, they need the split. They may suck at the split jerk still. They may have technical problems with the split or with the timing or with the drive, but you, you don't just abandon it because of that. You have to you know, teach them how to do it better. Just like if I'm not good at the snatch, I don't go, oh, well, the solution is I'm going to switch to a split snatch. Mm. Well, that's, that's not solving the problem. Yeah. You're just kind of looking for a different exercise. So you can screw that one up too. And the bar position on the on the jerk, base and neck in terms of finish position, same as same as snatch. Yep, exactly. Over the back of the neck, your head and your trunk is inclined forward very slightly to slightly. achieve that. You know, because you want the arms about vertical. Yeah. So to have to have the bar over the back of the neck, the trunk has to be inclined slightly. Mm. If you had that relationship, if your trunk was vertical, the bar would be behind your foot. Right. You can't, they don't, they don't build skyscrapers at a, at a 10 degree angle leaning one way. Right. It's unless it's, like, unless it's a lean and pizza and you know how that is. Right. That was unintentional as I understand it. Yeah. 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 Um, 
that was that was uh, poor site inspection. Um, <laughs> I'd always love to know how that conversation went with the foreman. <laughs> what the fuck, Tom? Yeah. So you only check the first six inches of the soil, huh? <laughs> Yeah, that's what you guess. I'm not going to lie. I'm actually delighted I asked you to go through that again because that was a whopper answer. What whopper, right. whopper is, uh, by, uh, uh, just for any internationals, is, is a good thing in Ireland. Like, that was whopper. It means it was great. Um, one just final, final technical thing I meant to ask you about. And just, again, to reiterate this for the listeners, get Greg's book, the third edition. Like, all this, like when I got your third edition, because I had your second edition, and do you ever know when the third edition comes out? And it came out pretty soon, like not too long after the second one. And you're always like, like I remember when I saw it, first, I was like, "Geez, how much like more?" Because the second yeah. one, the second one was pretty good, like you know. And then like, what do you do? Just reorder the chapters? That son of a. That's bitch. what I was kind of, you know, like oh, he maybe he added in a chapter or just. And I was like, really, like you shouldn't have called that third edition because it's a completely new book. It, it is, yeah. It's a huge change. Oh my god! Like, because when I, do you know, when Amazon goes, you know, look inside, and I was like, look inside, I was like, well, there's way more pages in this, and then like table of contents, like, holy bananas! Right. He broke everything down in this. So, uh, yeah, just for the listeners, like, uh, all the answers to the questions I've asked, and, and I really appreciate you being so patient because you could be like, just get my book, goddammit, uh, <laughs> are, are in his book and his brilliant certification course as well that I've had friend, a friend of mine, Joey Shaughnessy, over here and took it, and he was like, and he loves Olympic lifting. He's like, savage, Greg, every course is brilliant. Awesome. Um, just one last little thing was the, the wrist position just overhead. I know that's a common thing. You know, a lot of people, you know, like they let it flex, they let you know, we kind of want that neutral and punch. Is there any sort of tips you have to help people with that? You, know, you constantly see people yes. and they kind of get into that. It's almost, yeah. uh, it's really a conversation. If they kind of lack that, you know, if they can't get into that overhead position too well, it's like they almost overcompensate by flexing their wrist to get the bar right. more over their center of gravity. Yeah. It, 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 going back to what you were asking, you know, what are the most common mistakes? that's another big one is people holding the bar way too far back in their hands. You know, it's yeah. too, too far toward the fingers and that, that wrist is like hyper extended. And if, when you hold the bar that way, it's impossible to be really locked in tight overhead. You'll see, you know, someone holding a snatch or a jerk like that and everything is soft through the rest of the chain. The elbow becomes soft. The shoulder becomes soft. It's just, it, it's a mess. So the, the, the analogy or the, the picture I like to have people think about is imagine you think about a squat rack and the cradle of the squat rack. So that, you know, that upright post, that's your forearm. And then you have typically in the front, you have a little bit of a lower guide and in the back, you have a little bit of a higher guide or fence, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that's kind of your, your thumb in the front, your fingers in the back. So, you know, if you create that position with a bar overhead and your hand is open, uh, the, the wrist, the hand will be settled back a little bit. So, the, you know, the base of your palm is, is facing somewhat upward. The bar is in your palm, not in your fingers, but in your palm, very slightly behind the center line of your forearm, right? So it's, it is slightly behind the center, but it's not actually behind your whole forearm. That's way too far back. Yeah. And then from there, just close your hand. Uh, and so essentially what you, you are literally trying to cradle the bar and then wrap your hand around it. I think people, number one, they want this idea of a neutral wrist. So it's like, you know, the, the back of their hand is flush or is in line with the back of their forearm. Um, that places the bar in front of your forearm. It's incredibly unstable, uh, unstable. And it, it's really hard on your wrist. I, I can't hold a bar like that. I, I, I would blow out my, my arm. Um, but you, you have, you think about it, if that bar is perfectly centered or forward like that, it, it's, it has an equal tendency to move forward and backward. It's very unstable. If you have it cocked back and it's very slightly behind that center line, it's always pulling in, in one direction. It's very easy to stabilize, yeah. but you're also just putting your hand and your wrist in a strong position. Um, it would be, it would be, you know, that people are very familiar with bench pressing. Um, it would be like trying to bench press with the bar, you know, at, at the point where your fingers meet your hand, you know, think yeah. about how strong and stable you would feel there. It's awful. Uh, so imagine that squat rack cradle, create that with your hand, then wrap your hand around it and don't, don't grip the bar any more tightly than you need to maintain control and position. 
Great stuff. And if you do bench press, bench press like that, I hope the bar lands on your neck because you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's fantastic, Fabulous. Since I had only, I had you only booked in for eleven, so if you have to go, you can go. I do. Um, I got an athlete here. I got a coach. So she perfect. Kill herself. Perfect. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I, I have some other stuff I'd love to get you on, and we can always do a part two. But listen, Greg, where can people find out more information about you? catalystathletics.com is the portal to all things catalyst um yeah. that'll get you all the free articles and videos and exercise library um you know, there, there's a I, I think i personally have like 305 articles on that website alone plus your, we have your, other authors your video library is like outstanding it's the best one out there. Um, it is. What and that'll also get you, you know, we have, uh, we sell products online. So my, my books, other people's books, um, videos, you know, we have like full length seminar videos, you have four hours of video and stuff like that. American weightlifting, the documentary. Mm-hmm, that too. Um, and then of course our social media, pretty much the only one I'm active on anymore is Instagram. So that's just at catalyst athletics. Um, and of course, YouTube, really, I just make videos for Instagram now and then also post them on YouTube. So all my, all my instructional videos are like exactly one minute long. Right. People are always asking, why do you talk so fast? Well, because Instagram only gives me one minute and you guys get pissed if I post something that's longer than one minute. So what do you expect? Uh, and, so yeah, and, and, and people's attention spans are fucking shit. It's yeah, it's amazing. Listen, why, uh, why is this article so long? Why is this not a video? I know. Why is this video so long? Why is this not a picture? Holy shit, man. I just can't win. When, when I started giving art, I'll let you go now. But when I started writing articles for some websites, it, it, the rule was like, try not to have any longer than 500 words. Now they're asking for like 300 word articles. It's not even an article. It's like, that's a caption. I know. I know. It's, it's mental. Listen, I appreciate you so much, my man. I appreciate everything you're doing for our profession. You're an absolute legend. And um, I know you got to go now, but I'll email you afterwards just saying more thank yous and uh, we'll hopefully get a part two in. All right. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Greg, you're a legend. Take care, bud. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right. Bye-bye.